Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Board Games, where we talk about a few games that we played recently and give our thoughts on them. Yeah, so today we are going to be talking about five different games, all of which can be played in 30 minutes or less. Yes. Because uh, our schedule has been quite busy, so it's <laughs> nice to get these games that are shorter, kind of played really fast and yeah. easy to set up and easy to learn. Right. But first, today's episode is kindly sponsored by Pudcat, who are launching a game called Zero Day.exe on GameFound on October 15th. Welcome to the future, where a vindictive AI has taken over, and now a renegade crew must fight through battalions of bots to survive. In Zero Day.exe, players take on the role of one of eight unique characters and fight to reclaim the city of Shijima. This is a fully cooperative roguelike dungeon crawler in a cyberpunk style setting where players will be required to download hacks to add to their decks, attack enemy AI robots and scavenge them for parts to build mods and items, and complete operation specific objectives. The game features hand management and deck building, as well as deterministic combat that requires tactical decision making, because in this game, there's no dice rolling or card flipping. That's right, and your only hope for survival is to infiltrate their databanks and destroy them before they destroy you. So if Zero Day.exe sounds interesting to you, follow the link down below to their GameFound campaign, which launches on October 15th. And thank you so much to Podcat for sponsoring this video. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some of these games. Now, we do have to mention all of these are review copies sent to us by the respective publishers, mm -hmm. so just be aware of that. All right, the first game that we're going to be talking about today is a family-friendly, family-weight game, and it is one that we were highly anticipating. It is called yes. Cafe Barras. That's right. So this game was designed by Roberta Taylor and published by Kids Table Board Games, and this is all about, it's a card game, basically, where you are running your own cafe as a capybara. Now, mm -hmm. if you've never heard of a capybara, this is a, a type of animal. It's actually, the, they are actually the largest mammal in the, the world. Largest rodent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think there's whales that are really big, yeah. <laughs> there are much yeah. larger mammals in the world. It's the largest rodent. Largest rodent in the yes, world. Yes, yes, yes. Super calm-tempered, at least the ones that we've interacted with. Yes, I've loved capybaras for a very long time. I'm a big fan of odd animals. Wow. I really, really love giraffes. Uh, you know, wiener dogs are also an odd type of, strange, yeah. of dog. And so capybaras, uh, for some reason, has had a huge spike in popularity uh -huh. over the past several years. And uh, and now, for some reason, there are several games. themes, like yeah. board games that are being <laughs> released with capybaras, and I am all for it. Give me all of the capybara themes. I think this game was on our most anticipated of this year, right? Yes. It definitely Coming out was. in 2024, um, yeah. And I will say, and I think we said it in the video, yeah. in that video as well, that it was on the list for its theme mainly. Yeah. But Roberta Taylor has also designed a lot of other uh, family-friendly friendly games, such mm -hmm. as Creature Comforts and Maple Valley. This one is no exception in terms of its weight. And so the way that this game works is it is a card game through and through. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their own starting uh, barista or cafe, cafe owner. Cafe card, yeah. That is a capybara. And uh, a hand of cards. And basically, players are just going to be taking turns playing a card from their hand, either into their cafe, paying the cost in the top left-hand corner, and adding its item or a symbol, such as type of food or uh, entertainer, to your cafe so yeah. that you can fulfill orders in the future. Basically, doing it this way, uh, by playing a card in this manner, you are enhancing your business, right? So like you have more menu items to serve to mm -hmm. customers, you have wall decor that um, is maybe pleasing, or performers who are going to attract customers. Right, and each card is actually multi-use, mm -hmm. in the sense that you can either play it into your cafe, or you can play them as a customer who you are serving. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom of each card shows a combination of symbols, and they represent what the customer wants wants from your cafe. Mm -hmm. When serving them as a customer, you're going to earn one coin per symbol that you actually have in your cafe, which means you don't have to have the customer completely fulfilled mm -hmm. in order to serve to them because you are required to play one card on your turn, yep. regardless of whether or not you can afford to put it in your cafe or if you actually have those symbols to serve, which means you can potentially serve customers and not actually earn any money for them. Yeah, that's ideal, obviously, yeah. in a game like this. Worst uh, turn. Yeah, so <laughs> it, basically you just be tossing a card out. So so right. you want to at least try to get some money because you want to be able to churn and burn the money you make and then put in more cards yes. in that first manner, how we talked about uh, playing cards, mm -hmm. so that you can then e eventually attract more customers. Uh, there's also public objectives or public goals, mm -hmm. uh, scoring conditions at the end of the game that you're going to be trying to uh, achieve. 
achieve. Mm -hmm. Some of those might be have this particular food and this particular drink being served in your cafe at mm -hmm. the end of the game. So there's a little bit of uh, everybody has that kind of public knowledge of what cards could be very valuable to not only yourself, but also to keep away from your opponents. Right. The game comes with, I believe, nine or ten of those special cards. Mm -hmm. And each game you only play with a, a handful with of a them. handful, like five yeah. of them per game, these public objectives. In addition, the cards themselves have extra bonuses when you put them into play, some of them. Mm -hmm. There's a description box that'll either give you some sort of ongoing ability or a one-time benefit when you pay to put the card into play. Mm -hmm. And when serving a customer, if you're able to meet all three of the symbol requirements as well as the decor preference that De they have. Their aesthetic that they like. Then they become a regular and you'll actually tuck them into your cafe so that you can score points for them at the end of the game. Because typically when you serve any other customer, uh, they just give you money. Mm -hmm. You don't actually score the points for them. So you have to try to meet all of their symbols in order to actually score for them at the end of the game. Yeah, so how you get those symbols are, are how you play the card the first way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's maybe uh, a customer wants cake, they want this particular aesthetic uh, kind of design inside, and maybe they want a performer performing or something like that. So those are the kind of the cards that you have to kind of lay out. And so you have to have this hand management aspect of it where it's like, I want this card for its points, but I want this card for its end game scoring, which links into that. And this card is part of the public objective. So I have to just basically decide with the cards that the four cards that are in your hand, how am I going to get the right symbols in play so that I can satisfy the right customers at the right time? Yeah, that's essentially it. Mm -hmm. And uh, these regulars, by the way, are the timer for the game. So as soon as uh, one player has acquired a certain amount of them, I yeah. think it's depending on player count. That's right. Yeah, okay. Then that is one of the ways in which the game can end. And at the end of the game, players will score points for the cards in their cafe, as well as the regulars that they have, and the public scoring objectives. Yeah, that's one of the two ways the game can end. Also, if you go through the entire stack of of, of cards multiple mm -hmm. times after shuffling through. Yeah, then that the can second end time. It. Uh, in a two-player game, you're typically going to end it uh, via by, the way. By having regulars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I enjoyed this one, lived up to my expectations. A light card game that uh, has just enough decision-making, mm -hmm. something as simple as which card do I play for decor and for need for having symbols out? Mm -hmm. Which card do I draw back up in order to not only enhance my ability to score, but also take away from cards from my other opponents uh, because mm -hmm. of the public objectives? And just the right amount of kind of uh, pacing in the game. Uh, it never overstayed its welcome in our plays. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's very, it is very light. This is definitely a family weight game, but it mm -hmm. does play in about 30 minutes. It's very cute, like the illustrations. The artwork for all of Roberta Taylor's games are amazing, yeah. and this is no exception. But it's exactly what Naveen was saying. It just has just enough to make it uh, crunchy enough where you're actively thinking like, huh, which cards do I keep? If I play this, it's not, you only have like four cards in your hand at any given time. Mm -hmm. And the economy can be a little bit tight. So yeah. not having enough money to pay for a card being put into your cafe can be problematic, but you need to have the customers to serve in yeah. order for you to gain more money, but also you're keeping in mind the public objectives. So there really is just enough there for you to be like really, yeah. you know, thinking throughout it. And I also, I don't think we mentioned it. Uh, some of the cards, they have variable scoring depending on yes. what else you've set up in your cafe. That's, that's right. something that's also very important to think about when mm -hmm. you're trying to take and draft cards, mm -hmm. because you might find yourself in a conflict with the public objective where it's like I need to have eight coins at the end of the game mm -hmm. but I really need to spend my coins to get this in because I'm going to get a bigger multiplier on scoring yeah, uh, for something true. else so there's a lot of little little things in there again in a 30 minute package which yeah. is always nice it definitely uh, treads that balance between very being very very simple you know on your card on your turn sorry you're playing one card mm -hmm. that's it uh, but also having multiple things that you're trying to consider. Yep. So that's pretty much it. But uh, if you are curious about the age range, it is a two to four player game. And uh, apparently it's eight and up, eight and up in terms yeah. of age. And mm -hmm. I think that's about right. Yeah. So anyway, that is Cafe Barras. Okay, moving on to the second game we want to talk about. This is a city building uh, tile laying game from mm -hmm. none other than, of course, Uwe Rosenberg. That's right. Uh, very common themes for him. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> originally uh, published by Korea Board Games and now by Capstone Games. Yes, this is the newest uh, in the line of tile laying games, but it's a little bit different in the sense that these tiles are tangrams. tangrams. So if you are a kid from the 90s, you might be familiar with tangrams. I don't know if they use those in schools anymore. I'm not familiar with them, to oh, be honest. Oh, you didn't? Yeah. 
Yeah. Use tangrams? People, uh, people, I've heard people say, oh, tangrams. And I'm like, yeah, in elementary school, is. we did. Okay. So tangrams, now I'm going to get this all wrong. Okay. I don't know if that's, that's the literal definition of these, but when we were in elementary school, we had these oddly shaped tiles that they called tangrams. Mm. And we were given this like outline and we had to use the tangrams to fit them all in the shape. But the tangrams were all what? like diamonds. Like they, they have a very specific angular shape to them. It's so not like if like you're trying typical... to like make a bird or something, like a peacock or something like that. Yeah, you're supposed like, to use all the these to fit them in because they're they're difficult did to, have, maybe to we shape did. in. Maybe we did you that and did. I did not know these were called tangrams. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, this is an entire board game that is filled with tangram shaped tiles. And we are building a city on our player boards. Now, the way that the game works is each player has their own player board and their own set of identical tangram uh, tiles. Mm -hmm. Each tile is double-sided. There are mm -hmm. only two different types of terrain in this city, and that's going to be important because over the course of the game, our goal is to try to fill up as much of our board as possible while balancing these two types of terrain. Mm -hmm. In addition, the game comes with a deck of cards that uh, represents all of the different tiles in your supply. And each round, depending on player count, you're going to deal out a certain number of these cards to players as well as in the center of the table. Again, depending on player count, we are going to reveal each card one at a time mm -hmm. and we'll all simultaneously place that specific tile in our city. Yeah, so it's almost, think of it like kind of like a flipping right-ish or flipping uh, lay maybe. Yeah. Uh, very similar to like My City. Or, uh, if, yeah, or, My City yeah. or Karuba. Mm -hmm. Karuba was another, is another game that's really popular from Haba where, that has the same thing where mm -hmm. you basically reveal a card and everybody has to place the same like, tile. It's you the don't same have line. to. You could technically in this particular game, you could just toss that out, but yes. it's in your best interest, especially early on to try to fill up your board as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And when choosing your tile, you can choose which side of the tile to place yep. in your city. And that's going to be very, very important for scoring as you'll see. And so the way that it works in a two-player game, because that is the only player count that we played this at, by the way, is uh, we deal out four cards, one card to each player, and Secretly. We, we get to look at our we own card, yeah. but we can't look at each other's cards, mm -hmm. and then two cards to the center of the table, one that is going to be face down and one that is face up. Yep. And uh, during the round, we start with a face up card, and then we move to the face down card, revealing that, which means you don't get to look at it you know, beforehand. And again, because we talked about these all being tangrams, which I've now understood the definition, they're <laughs> awkward shape. So you, yeah. you're you trying to plan building out your city mm -hmm. by balancing the green and then the black tiles, which of course is your choice as mm -hmm. to how you want to do it. But you never know what tile is coming next. So right. if you're thinking, okay, I'll leave this with a little awkward overhang. And eventually I know there's a tile that'll slip in it might not show up for four or five rounds, so but you be careful. you have some information because you do have the the card that you have in your mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. So you do know that that's coming, which is actually really important for planning. And so after the two cards in the middle of the table have been played, then the players will play their cards one at a time. Right. And that's basically how the game works. You, you basically keep on playing. Uh, I believe it's... Six rounds. Yes, it's a total of six rounds. And at the end of each round, you're going to have end of round scoring, where basically all players will score their largest rectangle that's in your city. Yeah. So during the round, you're trying to create a larger and larger rectangle so that you can score more and more points from mm -hmm. round to round. But at the end of the game, you're going to count the number of squares that you're able to fully make of each type of terrain. You'll score additional points depending on how far off you were between the two types of terrains. Your goal is to have yeah. the green as terrain close as possible, yeah. uh, equal to the other, the city-like terrain. Yeah. Because if you're perfectly able to have a perfect balance between the green and the black tiles, you'll score an additional 20 points in the game. Yes. It, there's also fountain tiles that we'll be placing one out uh, mm -hmm. from round to round, and that also helps us complete areas as well as rectangles mm -hmm. but that is a that is pretty much the entire game yeah so this is probably the lightest of all of the tiling games that we played from Uwe Rosenberg. Mm. Now, if you're not familiar, we we have done an Uwe Rosenberg series in the past. We've chronicled all of his tiling games. Up as many to, as possible, I think. Up yeah. to the point of wherever we, we were at yeah. <laughs> at that time. Yeah, well, like we haven't covered Applejack. No. Uh, that's one I still want to play. Yes, yeah, yeah, we haven't played that one. Yeah. But uh, we've also done all of his big box stuff. And so we are not going to be doing a playthrough of this. It's going to be impossible for us to just do all playthroughs of his games. 
games forever. Yep. But of course, we wanted to talk about it mm -hmm. because we've played it a okay. couple of times. And so, um, like I was mentioning, this is the lightest that I've experienced, at least, of all of his uh, tile laying games because it really is as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just going to be revealing a card and everybody plays uh, their tiles. But I think the, the Uwe Rosenberg aspect of this is the complexity in the shapes, the balancing of the terrain, the tangram and the turn saying. order. Yeah. So the fact that, especially in a two-player game, you know, Uwe Rosenberg likes to, it, it seems like he likes to do things with turn order. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that in games such as uh, Oranian Burger Canal or uh, New Sphere. Or even Lahav. In Lahav. a two-player game, it's only seven turns, but one of you is going to get three, one's going to get four. Right. So the turn order aspect adds to the strategy or the thinking. Mm -hmm. And in, in such a light game like this, that definitely comes into play. Yeah. Uh, this particular one, though, um, even though I, I kind of enjoyed it, but I also kind of didn't at the same time same time. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of trying to balance the green and black, it seems like I wish there the, the there was penalties for not being able to do it mm -hmm. because um, getting just a large rectangle and then constantly scoring it for six times mm -hmm. is way more points than just trying to get, you know, the 20 uh, at, the end. at the end. You want to do both. Yeah, you want to do both. Thing. But um, the mo like in our games, we were scoring in the mid hundreds, so like 150, 160. So the balance aspect of it to nail it perfect was 20 points versus having just a large rectangle round mm -hmm. after round after round accounted for about 130 of those points. So mm -hmm. the balance kind of seemed a little off. Um, I don't know. There, there, there's the part of that that uh, just I wish there was a little bit more punitive damage for not being as close. <laughs> and so you really had to focus on it, you know? He wants the Agricola version. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, no, I, I hear you, though. This one definitely fell flat for me. Uh, just because, I don't know if it's, it, it's very simplistic. Like, mm -hmm. you literally are just putting out a tile, and the, the, the critical thinking there is, ooh, which areas do I want to leave for these really odd-shaped tiles? And I, f I felt like I wanted to enjoy the balance aspect of it a little bit more, more right? than I yeah. did. But in the end, it was a little bit too lackluster, I guess. Yeah. It, it just was, fell flat. In the first game is when I realized it about, like, round three. It's like, oh, wait, I've I've already scored, like, 60 points but my balance at the end of the game is the max i can get is 20 points mm -hmm. i'm just going to focus on just making sure that i just have this really big rectangle mm -hmm. and if i can balance them out in the end then i'll then i'll try to do that as i go because the rectangle scoring doesn't depend on the balance the color, like yeah. you don't you don't care about the colors of the tiles which by the way yeah. for such a uh, a simple looking game with not really much artwork the artwork is really cute it's actually very nice artwork yes <laughs> like looking at the tiles like this is cute it's such a whimsical looking yeah. city Very that nice. you're building you know for such a simple game I, I just thought that the artwork was nice so of course we are big fans of Uwe Rosenberg and always look forward to his designs this one unfortunately fell flat for me mm -hmm. but if you've played it we would love to hear your thoughts on it but otherwise that is Tamgram City all right next up we have a couple of small card games from the same publisher we have Sumo which mm -hmm. is a two-player only trick-taking game oh yeah and Tokuri Taking for two to four players. This is not a trick-taking game. I thought it was because it says taking, taking in the yeah, title. But they're both published by Bright Eye Games. Yeah. So let's just start with this one first. Sumo. Sumo. Ah, yes. The trick. Oh, it says trick-taking card game in the O This here. one tells you about trick-taking, yeah. Yes. Uh, Two-player only. Uh, the box says five minutes, and it's a very, very short game. Yes, it is very, very short. Uh -huh. The designer, by the way, this game is... Designed by Kota Kono. Mm. And uh, the reason why it is such a fast playing game is because this is a trick taking game that simulates a sumo wrestling match. Oh, yeah. So the game comes with a small deck of cards, only 25 cards. And the deck of cards is comprised of four suits, only numbered one through five. So the 25 cards are actually 20 <laughs> playing cards yeah. and then five cards that represent the sumo ring, the wrestling ring. Yeah, you kind of construct, you just put a couple cards together and it constructs the ring. And so the way the game works is each player is dealt a hand of eight cards. And so four cards will not be used in the round. Mm -hmm. And before you actually start the trick taking aspect of it, the game starts by players uh, trying to figure out who's going to go first. And the uh -huh. way that that works is each player will simultaneously play a card face down from their hand and then reveal it at the same time. And whoever played the higher number is going to be the lead player. Mm -hmm. But if nobody plays a higher number, if we just play the same number regardless of the suit, 
then we do it again and we keep on doing it until somebody does play a higher number, uh -huh. which means you can uh, play out your entire hand and not actually f have a lead player, yeah, so in like, which case you would start over. So if we both played a three and then we're like, okay, we both played another three, yes. okay, and then we bought, somebody then played a five and a four, then mm -hmm. it's like, okay, whoever played the five, you are the first player. All the cards played are out of the game. Yes. Yeah. They stay on the table. On the table, they do yeah. not. You do not replenish your hand. No. So whatever you have left in your hand is what you actually get to play with. Mm -hmm. So then, once a lead player is determined, then the trick-taking aspect starts. And it is played like a standard trick-taking game. The lead player will choose a card from their hand and play it face up. And then the other player must follow suit if they can. Yep. And if they can't, then they play any card from your hand. And keep in mind that at that point, your hand is very small. Like, you only have a few cards left. So. You have the eight you started with, yeah. the cards that you are flipping, mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yes, and I yeah. think that is by design, because yeah. you really want to be critical about specifically which card you are playing. There is a lot of card counting in this game. There is a you lot of card counting. You need to card count in this game. Yes, and so the way that scoring actually works is who, after the two cards have been played, whoever plays the highest card in the lead suit uh, wins that trick, and... In the match, you actually move the sumo wrestler cards towards the player who is losing, as if you push them in in the in sumo. So the you're, sumo you're getting match. them to the edge of the ring, yes. and you're trying to push them off. So uh, essentially, if you can win two in a row, uh, because it's basically middle, their end, your end. Yeah. And so once you get them from the middle, you try to get them to the edge, and then you want to push them off. And then off. you push them yeah. off. So as an example, if Naveen were to win two tricks in a row, he pushes the sumo over to my side, and, and then win. the second trick, he pushes them off. And mm -hmm. that is the simplest way of winning the game. Now, the thing about this game is there is a reference sheet that includes a list of several sumo moves. Like counters. Yes, yeah. counters. And these are ways in which you can just win the game. As an example, if you play a number four against a number one of the same color, then you win. Mm -hmm. Or if you play a number one against a number five of the same color. Or if you play a number two in a different color than the lead color, when you are on the edge of the, the, the mat, the ring essentially, then you win. And so it's not as simple as you just trying to win two tricks in a row. You, you have to be cognizant and careful of these you know, sudden death uh, moves. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> where the card game. counting comes in. So yeah. it's like if you're, especially like at the beginning, you're like, okay, we played three cards out. Mm -hmm. All right, I saw my three. I saw your three. I think Monique might have the one brown. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm safe here. But then there's those four cards at the beginning of the game that you're kind of gambling on. So it's like I got her up against. Mm -hmm. Is she short suited here? Can I play a Can I play a card? Because if she plays a two off suit mm -hmm. and I have her on the edge, then she automatically wins. So you have to be very cautious and very careful uh, depending on kind of the game state for mm -hmm. how simple and how quick of a game it is. Yes. Um, at first, the very first time I played it, I was like, this isn't much. Naveen <laughs> There's nothing going on here. Naveen. This is... What is this? Oh my, this? Naveen was over it when we played this the first time. But the more and more I understand the counter moves and the, the positions that you can be in, in for such a quick five minute game, yeah. it's actually pretty entertaining. It is. Yeah. You know, the first time we played it, um, I think somebody had told me maybe that they didn't really care for the game. And so I already kind of had this like, okay, just try to figure it out yourself kind of thing. And it's a five minute trick-taking game for two players. So yeah. what what could it possibly be like, you know? Yeah. And then when we played it the first time, you know, you don't really have the card counting aspect uh, locked down yet in terms of knowing exactly how you should be playing the game. Mm -hmm. So it, it plays so quickly that it kind of felt like that's it. Like <laughs> you just win. Like how, how could you possibly strategize? It definitely was one that after several plays, it's like, oh, oh. It's really a mental game. Okay, it is a mental game. Yeah, you're trying to figure out like, oh, what are the chances that they have this card in their hand? Because four cards are just out of the game. Yeah. So you cannot, uh, you cannot perfectly card count. Something as simple as that very beginning, who is going to be the first player? You're getting information mm -hmm. from your opponent yes. when they're playing when the they're card playing face up uh, to determine who's going first. It's like, okay, you just played a three brown. I just played my five brown. Mm -hmm. So that means if I play a brown and Monique is short suited in that and she has twos, she can instantly win if I have her up against the edge. So you got to be very, very cautious of those moves. And so it's it's very important to know the five like instant wins mm -hmm. uh, in the game. So yeah, um, without sure the instant yeah. wins, then it would be very just very okay. Very okay. Yeah. The instant wins are really what make the game. And I think that the game is so, it's it's very, it's entertaining because it's so quirky. You yeah. know, the theme, the way that they implemented the theme 
with a trick taking aspect is interesting. The so, fact that you're pushing, you uh, know, the cards over to your side. So when we went to Japan last year, uh, we actually went to a sumo tournament. And yeah. every time the, the next, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like every time there's about to be a match, there's this like tension buildup excitement. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's just boom. And then it's over within yeah. like it's an explosion. a few seconds. And so it, this game kind of tries to obviously emulate that, emulate that in a card <laughs> yeah. game. Like, okay, it's, it not, it's okay. not sumo, like let's be honest, yeah. but but that anticipation of like, okay, here's your eight, here's my eight. Uh -huh. Who's going first? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, okay, I'm going first. Oh, you have, okay, that's one green card. Why did she play a green card of all the cards that she could have played? Mm -hmm. Why did she play the three green? Okay, maybe she's trying to short suit herself there. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little, little heady things. And so, um, I don't know. I, 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 this is one that I've had a complete 180 on from when we first played it to where I am now talking oh, about it. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, yeah. I enjoy it. This is a good travel game. Now, obviously, this is not like, the best trick taking no, game no, of all time. Like, I'm not trying to say that. It's not incredible, no. but it's entertaining. And it's definitely, it, you definitely get what you want out of it in that five minute. You know what I mean? Like and that five-minute gameplay. Like it does what it wants to do. It's entertaining <laughs> because we play against each other. Yes, that's the other thing. Because yeah, we are yeah. we are playfully competitive with yes. each other on games Extremely. like this. Even playing something like Mario Kart, we're very competitive. Yes. Like, <laughs> you know, something like that. So yeah, yeah. it's nice to just like one-up the other one. When yeah. you think, like the most recent time I played, we, we played and Monique just got me on one of those instant wins and it was just like... Yeah, it definitely definitely has those moments. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that is Sumo. sumo it's a yeah. silly, you know, two-player trick-taking game, but it is quirky. And I love finding quirky uh, games that are, you know, that, that has that gameplay there that's just entertaining enough. So mm -hmm. Yeah, so there you go. That is Sumo. All right, moving on to the other one. This is a different designer, same publisher. This is Tokuri Taking by <laughs> Takashi Saito. Yeah. And uh, it is not a trick-taking game. This is <laughs> a game for two to four players in which you... Arch so the theme is really interesting. I know there are dinosaurs on the, the box cover here, but the theme technically is we are drinking We're sake, drinking sake yeah. I believe, and they are in these these bottles, which I think are called tokuris. They're traditional The traditional, sake bottles. Yeah. yeah, bottles. And the way the game works is everybody has a hand of cards, and at the start of the game, you have to choose one of your cards from your hand and place it face down, because at the back of each of these cards is a tokuri bottle, mm -hmm. and this is supposed to symbolize the, the sake that you are drinking. And how full it is. And how full it is. Yeah. So when you play that first card uh, face down, you also take a stick that comes with the game, and you put it on the 10, marking that your bottle is completely full. It's Ten full. Yeah. Yes. Now the object of the game is for you to uh, completely empty as many of these tokuri sake bottles yeah. as fill possible. Them up, fill them up and drink them. Yes. Yeah. And so on your turn, you are either going to play a card from your hand face down in front of you as another tokuri bottle, or you're going to play it for the card effect, which is going to be emptying a certain amount of sake or drinking, mm -hmm. I guess, <laughs> a certain amount of sake from a certain number of bottles. So for each number that, that is showing on your card, you must be able to empty exactly that amount mm -hmm. from one bottle. So you might have a card that says five plus five. So that means one bottle, you must be able to empty five. Mm -hmm. And then from another bottle, you can empty another five. Right. You cannot uh, split that up. So if I have a bottle that has four and another one that has one, I cannot say four of the five is one and one is to make it the total five. Correct. Hope that makes sense. In order for you yeah. to completely drink the bottle, you have to nail it exactly. Nail it, so yeah. if you only have two left on a bottle, then you have to play a card that has a two at some point right. somehow. Um, now, whenever you play a card and you empty bottles, you can choose any bottles around the table. And that is right. where the true heart and soul of the game comes into play because uh, you can't pass until you've run out of cards, which means mm -hmm. if you don't have that math showing around the table, then you're going to be forced to play a card as a Tokuri bottle in front of you. Putting more pressure on you to try to empty it by mm -hmm. the end of the game because right. if you do not empty it, if you if you're... Uh, bottle is full from three to ten, mm -hmm. then you get negative points. Right. If it's at a one or a two, then it won't score it's you any neutral, negative. Nothing. But three or higher, then each bottle that you have that's that full is going to score you negative two points. Two points yep. And for each bottle that you are able to empty, then you score one point. So you're losing more points than you're gaining mm -hmm. in that case. So it's just right. a big balancing act of trying to empty. It's really a big math problem. It is, yeah. There's no it's, passing in the game. So yeah. it's like on your turn, if, if you cannot figure out how to play a card, you're going to have to figure out which card are you going to play face down mm -hmm. to represent another 10 that you're on the hook for. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's kind of like the game. It's like, well, if I put this card face down, mm-hmm. I have this card that then gets me to drop eight in a bottle. So when it comes back around to me, that 10 will become a two. Mm-hmm. But let's say Monique or another player on the table has that example, that five and five, and they only have one bottle that they want to drop. Then if they drop my 10 down to a five and now it comes back around to me, that eight I was planning on using on my bottle yeah. is no you, longer you no there longer mathematically. I cannot go beyond zero. So right. That's where kind of like the cleverness and kind of the quirks of the game go. And that's what it feels like to play it. Mm. You know, at the start of the round, you look at your hand of cards and you're basically thinking, what kind of math can I do to add up to 10 so that I can completely empty out my bottles without helping my opponent? Mm -hmm. And which cards will I be playing face down? There are also some uh, cards that have extra bonus effects, like some cards will require uh, players to pass a card to the player on their left, stuff like that. There's a one one card that is, uh, you cannot play this card unless it's the very last card in your hand. So that's kind of like a hot potato card that you're like, I don't want this card because if it's my last card, then I have no way to empty that 10, so I need to find a way to pass that card right. to somebody else. There are also dummy Tokuri bottles where you can only play it as a face-down bottle, but if you empty it, it doesn't actually score you a point, yep. but it still counts against you if you were unable to empty it. So there is stuff like that also, but at the same time, you are basically just trying to uh, execute your plan while trying to avoid other people foiling mm-hmm. it. So yep. that is the, the heart and soul of the game. And then at the very end, whoever scores the most amount of points is going to gain these chips from all other players equal to the difference between their scores. Right. And that's how you determine the winner of the game. You pretty much can continue playing rounds until one player has completely Someone's run out of out. chips. Yeah. So that's essentially it for mm-hmm. Tukuri taking. Now I will say, um, it's not the best two-player game. I don't, I don't and think so, yeah. Unfortunately, that is the only player count that we were able to play it at. Right, right. So keep that in mind. It plays two to four players, 15 minutes on the box. Um, two players, uh, because you want to m- have more math cards out there in mm-hmm, play, mm-hmm. in our two-player games, uh, some of the cards that allow you to pass particular cards to other players yeah. or move cards around and draw more cards up, they're just not in play as much, mm-hmm. um, are potentially not in play as much. So like there was one round where I got stuck with several of those dummy bottles and I we never had a card that said pass a bottle to mm-hmm. somebody else. So it was just kind of like I'm stuck with these. I'm on the hook for these, but I have to play these face down. So then yeah. what's left in my hand is the math that I can finagle here. So it, it can feel very lopsided in kind of one way. Yeah. I, I think this game is... Definitely probably better at three and four. I think so. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I don't necessarily think that it's bad at two. It's just, I didn't enjoy it as much at yeah, two. I, I think it, it's probably more strategic, um, but I don't think that's the point of the game. The point of the, the point of the game feels like the aspect where you can lower everybody else's bottles and having to deal with that chaos. Yep. And it's just not as present in a two-player game. In a two-player game. game, yeah, especially with the passing of cards to each other. It's just like, well, here's the card. And then yeah. there was one time uh, we played it where it was like, here's one card, and then you passed me, and then we had another pass, and it's like, well, here you go back again. It's like, well, that just undid everything that we Yeah, did. and then the, the scoring at the end in a two-player game, just like just, <laughs> giving all your chips yeah. to one player constantly. Yeah. It's just, I don't know, I would recommend it at higher player higher, counts if yeah. you're going to try it. But it is a fast-playing game. It is also quirky, like the sumo game, but but I found the sumo game to be much more interesting, mm. especially at two. You know, this one has a cute theme. It has cute artwork. And they're very different games. I don't actually mean to compare them. They're yeah. very, they're separate games. But this one fell a little bit flat, I think, for me. I think I like the potential of it more than, than you do. Mm. I, I actually really want to play this at the full four and then mm. maybe give an, an update as to how I felt about <laughs> it. Uh, so I'm going to try to bring this to like our local convention or something and force people to play it with me. It is very fast yeah. playing, mm-hmm. but that's essentially it. Yeah. That is Tokuri Taking. Okay, talking about our last game today, this is coming to us from Cosmos, and it is called The Gang. Yes. Now, this is a game that came out at uh, Gen Con, mm-hmm. uh, and it Super was popular. Very popular at yeah. Gen Con, one of those sleeper games. Um, we got to play it there, fortunately, and we are going to talk about it today. Yes, this is a game for three to six players, yep. and it plays in about 20 minutes, and it's designed It's designed by two people, John Cooper and Corey Heath. Mm-hmm. And so in this game, players are working together, it's a fully cooperative game, in order to order the strength of their hands in a poker-style game. Yes. So it's based off of Texas Hold'em, specifically the Texas Hold'em style of poker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the end of the entirety of a hand of Texas Hold'em, which consists of everybody getting two cards, 
There's the flop, which is three cards, followed by a turn card, which is the fourth card, and then the river card, which is the fifth. So seven cards total. Mm -hmm. You have to, by the end of the game or end of the, the, the hand, uh -huh. um, you have to order your hand in relative strength from weakest to strongest. Yes. If you do that successfully at the very end of the round, then you win that particular round. Now, in order to understand the game, you probably need to have some knowledge of poker. poker yep. uh, we're not going to explain that right now. Sure. So just so you know, for anybody who is familiar with poker, the way that the gang works specifically is each player will have a hand of two cards that you keep secret. Mm -hmm. And before any other cards are revealed, there are these chips in the middle of the table that's going to be depending on player count. Each player is going to take one of these chips, uh, basically communicating to all other players around the table how strong they think their hand is. So if you think, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get like the royal flush, that's a really strong hand, right? Then you would get the, you would take that the highest valued number. If you had like two aces, which is the strongest hand in, in, in Texas Hold'em at the very beginning, oh. you would take the <laughs> highest value star and you would adamantly take it and be like, I'm taking this thing. Yes. So you're basically communicating what you think the relative strength of your poker hand is or your ability to make a solid poker hand. Uh -huh. Um, at the very beginning by taking these chips. So if right. I have a really strong hand and somebody took that very high value one, I am I can take that chip away from that person. You can, yes. You can just be like, mm, mm, Yes, mm, everything you do is yeah. communicating yeah. something about your hand. It's nonverbal. Yeah. Once everybody has agreed that, okay, we can go with this, then you reveal cards in the center of the table. In a Texas Hold'em fashion. Yes. So if you're familiar with Texas Hold'em, then you'll have the flop, which mm -hmm. is you reveal three cards face up, and now everybody is in possession of those three face up cards plus the two cards in your hand. Yes. So maybe uh, if I started with two tens and I thought that was a pretty solid hand, and then all of a sudden on the three cards that are face up, we see an ace, a king, and a queen. Then I'm like, my two tens are probably not as strong as they once were because anybody who has an ace, anybody who has a king, or anybody who has a queen in their two cards is probably beating me at this point. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where you're trying to tell the story every single um, street is what they call it in, mm -hmm. uh, in poker. Um, so while well, Naveen was really strong at the beginning, but based mm -hmm. off these three cards, he doesn't feel as strong anymore because he took that the very high chip at the very beginning, but now in this turn, he's taking like a middling chip. So mm -hmm. you do that all, all along the way. And then um, at the very end, uh, so after five cards have been uh, exposed face up plus the two cards you have, this is where it really matters how you communicate the relative strength of everybody's hand because you only win or are successful if everybody orders from weakest to strongest only at the very, very end of the hand when everything is revealed. So you have a total of four... For communication. So you communicate when yes. you first have your two cards. Yeah. Then you communicate when three cards are face up. Then when a fourth card is face up. And then and when then the that final fifth one. one is face up. That is where you have to be absolutely perfect. You cannot have anybody relative uh, just even off by just one uh, space because then you would fail. The theme of the game, by the way, is you are trying to ba uh, break into a vault <laughs> and steal the loot. <laughs> the heist. The heist, yeah. <laughs> the so gang. If you're successful, you open up one of three vaults. If you are unsuccessful, then you are going to trigger an alarm. You're trying to open three vaults before you trigger three alarms. Uh, if you open up a vault, then you're going to get a card that's going to make it a little bit more challenging. Mm. If you trigger an alarm, then you're going to get a helping card that kind of helps you along the way in mm. the next hand. So mm -hmm. uh, the game is played over a max of five rounds, right? Because you can only open three safes in two alarms or mm. vice versa. Yeah. But that's essentially that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the gang yeah. in a nutshell. Now, the first time I heard of this, I thought for some reason that it was going to be a follow-up of sorts to the crew. That's what they were, because they were kind of pitching at that at Gen it, Con. In a way, it is. It's not trick-taking. It's definitely, it's no, sorry, yeah. it's not. It's not a follow-up to the crew at all. This is no. not trick-taking, but it is sort of the same small box style, fully cooperative uh, sort of game, mm -hmm. right? That's that's where the similarities end. <laughs> like This is a entirely different game. Yeah. Um, now, I will say that I've only played this once. Naveen has played it way more Several times. Several times, yeah. And uh, this one is really... <laughs> This is not a Monique game. <laughs> this one's not for me. Unfortunately. Now, the thing is, I don't know poker. I have no, I don't know poker at all. She doesn't like, know poker and she doesn't know Texas Hold'em. I only so. know poker hands that b because of board games that use poker hands. <laughs> like flip down. Yeah. <laughs> because they always have like the poker hand reference sheet and I just kind of follow along with that. Or like playing um, Pusoidos or something or, or Deuces if you've heard of those games like that. Like, 
hand shedding games that yeah. require you to use poker hands. So Monique was not a big fan of this, unfortunately. And now I understand people's frustrations who play the crew and not understand trick taking because it sort of felt like that. You have to be able to decide on your own. You have to be able to communicate your hand, which requires you to think independently and to fully understand the yeah. situation. I am a big and Texas Hold'em player. Yeah. Uh, I've been playing Texas Hold'em for many, many years. Yes, uh, so this is definitely the years. So, game. So what are, your, what are your thoughts? I love this game. I am complete opposite of Monique. Yeah, I'm I upset. absolutely love this game. This is, we're gonna do a, our best games of the year. This is definitely gonna be on there somewhere. I'll figure, wow. out, I'll figure out where it's gonna be. Um, such passion. Yes, yeah, such passion with this <laughs> one. Uh, it says three to six players. I highly recommend playing at the five or six player count just because of that communication. Like, you, if you know poker and you have a hand like nine five, nine five offsuit, like, what is that? Like, relative to everything else, like, when, you, when you're trying to communicate. But over the course of the round, it just becomes so interesting as if you are, if you can understand relative hand size and, and hand value, and everybody else around the table has that kind of understanding, that foundational knowledge mm -hmm. of poker and mm -hmm. what is a good hand, it can be a really, really fun experience. And so I've played with a lot of people that do know poker, mm -hmm. and we have a great time playing this mm, game. That's awesome. Yeah. Does it play at 20 minutes? Uh, we, yeah, no, it, it played a little bit longer, longer. than that. Yeah, definitely. Play, uh, yeah, I don't know about the 20 minutes. 20 minutes probably per like, I mean, maybe. This this one, we I would say it plays maybe in the 30 plus. Um, and you said that you like this, the five, six player count. What about the lower ends? Lower ends is just a communication, just like in regular poker, right? Like, um, there's just more, more people to account for, for hands, right? Mm. So like, if I have a ace king in a three player game i'm mm -hmm. probably pretty good most, okay. most of the way mathematically six players it's like well it, things can change you know now i will say uh you know take everything that i had said with a grain of salt because i don't know poker like i said but i will say that for people who don't know poker you might fall into the same position that i did just because like I felt, I felt very lost when the, I was playing the game. If you don't know poker, um, and Texas Hold'em is a very specific style of poker, hmm. knowing your relative hand in a five or six player environment is going to be kind of tough because there was there was times where I have played with people who don't know, um, and then they'll reveal their hand at the end. I'm like, oh, that was actually it's actually kind of a strongish hand, hmm. especially like with these options. And this is kind of what your hand can become, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. over the course of the round as more cards get revealed. But you wouldn't know that if, you know, if, if you're not a, a yeah. poker player right, slash right, a Texas right. Hold'em player. So there is definitely that kind of like learning curve mm -hmm. that would have to kind of be it's learned tough. along the way. But it's kind of like, hard, it yeah. is kind of like the crew playing yeah. the crew and not knowing, not understanding trick taking. Like that is a, that is a tough position to yeah, be in. At least early so. on. But once, I guess once you see the flow and understand it, then like yeah. you can get better at it. So, I mean, that I guess that is the important message. So just keep in mind, if you really know that you love poker, might be something to check out. Yeah, for sure. If you don't know anything about poker, just walk into it uh, knowing that you are not alone. <laughs> because <laughs> we, yeah. we have very, very opposite experiences. Yeah. If you have never, or if you don't really know uh, poker that much, but you have played this and you enjoy it, I would love to hear your yeah, thoughts. I do want to know I would love to hear other that, yeah. people's experiences with the gang who don't necessarily know poker. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. That is The Gang, one of my favorites of the year so far. That's really, really cool to hear. Yes. Because Naveen... I really like You it. know, Naveen is very passionate about board games, sometimes mm -hmm. more so than I am. But to hear, you know, you rave about one particular game after, especially after just the first time you played it. Just so. right when it was explained to me, I was like... I'm I already I'm love it. like I already love this game. Yeah. So yeah. Um, really, really good. And I also like that um, they have that kind of like if you fail, then things get better. Yeah, if yeah, you, yeah, if yeah, you do yeah. Well, then they the kind game of start, aspect of the it. The game aspect that's of it. Not just poker. Because technically, you can just play. If if it didn't have that, you can just technically play yeah. it with poker chips and, and a hand of cards. Well, there you have it. Those are another five games that we were able to talk about today. Mm -hmm. The next Let's Talk Board Games episode will hopefully include some more mystery style, uh, something more along the lines of Halloween. Yeah, we're And speaking to, yeah. of Halloween, I would love to hear if you are playing any spooky games. I know mm -hmm. that people like to play uh, specific games around the holidays, and we are we are approaching the holidays. We'll be doing a couple playthroughs, uh, horror-based or like um, 
Halloween ish vibe fantasy kind of fantasy, fantasy games. Theme. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll primarily. have a few of those coming out this month. Yes. And I know in the last uh, Let's Talk Board Games episode, we mentioned that be warned because October is a very Kickstarter uh, crowdfunding heavy month for us mm-hmm. for some reason this year. Stay tuned because the next couple of days is where that is going to be hitting the hardest. So we have a lot of crowdfunding videos coming out over the next couple of days, and then it'll slowly uh, sort of plateau from there. So there you have it. Those are a few games that we have played recently. Uh, Thank you so much to ZeroDay.exe from Pudcat Games for helping sponsor this video. Uh, Please let us know also in the comments what games you have been playing or what you plan to be playing this month over the course of Halloween in the spooky season. And thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.